Hey everybody, today is Monday, October 7th, 2019. My name is Mad Fury and you are listening to The Rough Cut. All right, here we go again. It's that time. Welcome back to The Rough Cut. Hope you've been enjoying the rebooted podcast. It's been a lot of fun doing it um, for no better reason than it gives me another excuse to talk to editors. But not just editors. If you listened to last week's podcast, you heard um, music editor Andy Patterson alongside picture editor Chris Dickens. And I really like that. I'm going to try and do more of that when I can. And when I say more of that, I mean incorporating more post team members besides the editors. I think it not only adds another perspective, but in talking to the people who interact with the editors, you can actually learn more about editing. And in that vein, a few weekends ago, I was able to take part in an event at Sony Pictures Studios in Culver City, California. It was put on by Mix Magazine, and it was their Sound for Film and TV event. I had never been to this before, but I had a really good time, and I hosted a couple of panels. One was with the sound team for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and the other was for Spider-Man Far From Home. Both panels were presented in the Cary Grant Theater at Sony, and coincidentally, both films were mixed on the Avid S6 console in that very theater, and Sony kept saying it was the largest S6 installation in the world, which I wouldn't know any better, so I believe them. It certainly looked impressive. The other thing those two films have in common is that their picture editors were featured in previous Rough Cut episodes. So we had Fred Raskin for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Dan Lebenthal for Spider-Man Far From Home. And it was really cool to kind of get the other side of the story from the sound teams. So we're going to try and have those panels up on avid.com in November. So look for those. And even if you're not into audio post and you just sort of consider yourself a hardcore film video editor type person, I encourage you to watch these panels because again, you just learn so much about filmmaking in general and how the lines between picture and sound post are really blurring and that there are efficiencies to be gained by working together more closely. And I think you got that with the podcast last week with Chris Dickens and Andy Patterson on Rocketman. But what about this week's podcast, you say? Well, we're kicking off the week in a big way with a film that has generated a ton of conversation ever since it made its public debut at the Venice Film Festival, where it received an eight-minute, yes, eight-minute standing ovation, and that film is Joker. And the editor who deserves his fair share of that ovation is Jeff Groth. Leading up to his work on Joker, Jeff had a broad spectrum of project types under his belt. Um, He did unscripted TV, scripted TV, documentary film, comedies, dark comedies. The latter two categories are best represented by his work with Todd Phillips, who co-wrote and directed Joker. And as you'll hear Jeff talk about in this interview, the recent films he did with Todd, films like The Hangover 3 and War Dogs, all helped pave the way for what led to their collaboration on Joker, even where their work evolved from comedic to something much darker. And that's also a big part of the conversation around Joker is just how dark the film really is and how intense Joaquin Phoenix's performance is. And the people that have seen this film, there are those like any film that that loved it, liked it, some hated it, uh, but they were all unified in their appreciation of what Joaquin Phoenix brought to that role. And as always, the editor's skill as a storyteller is what helped take those performances to the next level. So let's hear what that editor has to say about that. Here's Joker editor Jeff Grove. Semi weird, but well, I you, try to keep busy and I try to keep quiet. So <laughs> <laughs> busy and quiet, the hallmarks of a good editor. We were talking a little bit earlier about the Venice Film Festival and This is a film that has generated a lot of conversation for some time, um, even before its release date. Going back to Venice, and I imagine that was your first real experience seeing the film with a true audience, you know, outside of people working on the film. Yeah, we did. We did uh, two very, very small test screenings. Then uh, we did a larger audience with Warner Brothers. Uh, It was an international international meeting that they were having and it was that it was about 450 people but venice i believe was about a thousand people in that theater so definitely by far by a factor of two the the largest audience i'd seen it with all of course people that that hadn't seen the movie before um it was pretty incredible the, the theater's beautiful you know I, th- I feel like they lock that theater up when when the film festival is not going on they just keep it keep it pristine it's like a museum yeah (laughs) so screenings had you done any test screenings at all before venice or could you consider that the first true screening where you got feedback from an audience we got feedback from our first two test screenings of they were about 75 people per screening on a small theater in a room at warner brothers so we did get some feedback then and then we again we we did what i guess we we kind of considered a third test screening but it was really 
the final version of the film that we played for Warner Brothers International. And like I said, that worked as a test screening for us because there were about 450 people there. So we got a sense of what a larger audience would be. I mean, I was as nervous for that one as I was for any other test screening. So I consider it a test screening. So based on uh, your level of nerves and obviously the profile of the film, you must have been just elated and, and just beside yourself because the, the early reviews from that from the festival were just, the, the buzz was intense. Yeah, and and it's it. I mean, the the best part about it is you feel kind of like okay, they got it. You know, it was the in general, the reviews were were good to amazing. So I, I can't ask for more than that. That was, I mean, the experience itself was amazing. Well, you've also done something that's pretty uncommon in this in modern era of reboots and franchises. I mean, yes, this is a a franchise in a sense, and it's certainly a character that's been visited multiple times. But the tone of this film and the style of, of Joker here is a lot different. Yeah, we were never thinking, we, I guess we were always thinking of this as just kind of a movie. It wasn't a DC movie. It wasn't necessarily the Joker movie. We were just trying to make a good movie. Um, and then it has this overlay of Joker on it, which means you have to pay attention to certain things. Like when you call the movie Joker, you know you're going to get to a place, you're going to see the Joker at some point. Uh, but that was, I guess, the biggest thing, and then it's a character study, and it's like, how do we get to that point? And you see him at the beginning of the movie, and I feel like one of the, the things that I'm most proud of with the movie is that you kind of see him at the beginning, and you wonder, how am I going to get to this point? How am I going to see this guy? And then when, when you do finally get, when he does finally appear on screen, you kind of look back a little bit and say, wow, how did we get here? That's amazing. I can't believe that we got here from there. When Todd first shared the script with you, could you see it right from then, just looking on the page, like, wow, this is something that's totally different. There's just um, a real fresh take on this character that people aren't going to be expecting. Yeah, the script was great from the first time I read it, which was at least a year before uh, we went into production. I'd say not only is it probably the best script I've ever read, it is the most clear script I've ever read in terms of I, I could immediately tell the movie that he wanted to make. And I told him that immediately. It was just it was like this. It's so clear that the movie that you're you're after here. And I think he would say that he got that movie. Now, you've you certainly worked with Todd before, and we can get into that in a little bit. But here, um, he's co-writer of the film as well. When you're working with a director that's also a writer on the project, does that make it any harder in editorial and that they might be a little closer or a little more protective of some of the things that you as an editor are like, you know what, it, that's just not working. we got to cut that. Todd knows editing. He knows how to run an Avid. As both the director and the writer, he's very willing to cut things. In fact, I feel like he's, he isn't happy until he's cut something from the movie to begin with, you know, just kind of off the bat. Like once we get some, we cut a scene, I think he's happier. The two things that, I, that are interesting about him being the writer is one is I always use with, especially with directors who are also the writer, I use the script tool. And I do that because we, uh, with that, they're always, they're very specific about their words. And so it's, that's the time that I need to be able to go back when we get, you know, four months into it, then I have that tool to say, okay, yes, like, I know you have this line that you wanted it to say in this way. Now let's go back and look at every one of those. And it's always right there. And you have it for the entire, you have it for the entire script. Um, and like I said, always with a writer director, it's, I feel like of paramount importance to have that because they, they are so they, they put those words on the paper. They got somebody to say those words. Now they want to see how we get those words, you know, how we actually deliver them. And the other thing with Todd is as a writer director, he is extremely talented at reutilizing dialogue. So if we cut a scene, but we still want to get some of that information in there, he finds a spot for it. Uh, so let's, or if we've cut, if we've cut a, a piece of the dialogue, let's say we've cut a few lines out of there, out of a scene to make the scene shorter, he still finds ways to use those lines, the lines that were recorded with the original take and, and stick them in places in ways that, you know, and, and kind of rearrange the dialogue in a way that is, I'm always learning from. So would this be within the same scene or sometimes within the same scene? Sometimes he'll take the dialogue from another scene. If, if it's something that he doesn't want that he's written, he doesn't want to lose and feels that it's important, but we've lost, let's say the scene where that dialogue appears, he'll find a place in the rest of the movie for maybe just the dialogue that's off camera or is, um, you know, on someone's back or something like that. Like he's very talented at rearranging the words that were there. 
thinking about um, you know Joaquin Phoenix and the, and the type of performances he's known for, and, and I'm sure how much he just dug into this role. Did he give you a lot to work with in terms of, I mean, where there's there a lot of coverage and a lot of different performances that Joaquin did on some of these lines? Did he improvise at all? Yes to everything. He is, I mean, it, it was, it was a kind of an embarrassment of riches. I wish I could show everybody every take, you know, I wish I could just release all the dailies cause he's incredible. Uh, he would do things. He would, he would, he would do things one way and he would halfway through maybe, um, he would change things up maybe to, to kind of bring the scene alive again. If they've, if it had been, if we'd done five takes, maybe in the sixth take, he, he, he'd change things up, bring it alive again. And we'd continue to move forward from there. Uh, the amazing thing about him is that when we turn around and get the other side of the coverage or something like that, he would do all the same things. So we, I, I always, almost always had the con, like continuity and performance and continuity and movement um, he, he remembered where he was. He smokes a lot in the movie. He remembered where he was in every cigarette. I feel like throughout the scene, it was, there was, there was attention even paid to that. And he, that's while he's doing all the other acting that he's doing, he's still paying attention to, you know, each little bit of, of his movements and his, and where the cigarette's burning and all that. A film like this, it's the devolution of a character over time and you're doing it, you're creating the film, you're shooting it non-linearly. Does it get tough to sort of keep track of you know, where is he in his arc from semi-tragic figure, you know, somebody that's been bullied to evil villain? The interesting thing about that is that, yes, we're shooting out of order, but what I ended up doing was cutting in order. So day one, we actually shot the first scene in the movie. So that was easy, but it took me three days to really, I mean, it was, it was a long scene. It's not what is now the first scene in the movie. It's the third scene in the movie, but it was a long scene. It was about six minutes long. And, um, it was that scene in itself was almost like it's a little short film. Like it was, it was, it kind of encapsulated the whole movie. So I spent a long time on it. By the time I was done with that, I had all, I had obviously more dailies to deal with, but what I would do then is to cut in order. So if, as soon as I got scene two, I would go and cut scene two. As soon as I got scene three, I would go and cut scene three and I would leave things in later reels until I got there. So I would always be working in order. I'd always work on the next numerical scene that I could, that I had to work on. So things that let's say scene 120 sat by the, if I hadn't gotten to it on the day of dailies, then it sat by the wayside until I could get to that end. That once we were, once we were done with shooting, then I had a real one that was in really great shape and I had a real seven that was basically non-existent. Um, but that, I think helps to keep track of where you are. It's not, it's not necessarily a thing that I've done on other movies. It's in this one in particular, it seemed like it was a good idea because then if we were coming in and watching, you could watch kind of the progression of the character up to that point. Um, And it wasn't, you mean you weren't watching the whole movie because you might be missing scene five and scene 10 and whatever, but you could watch things in order and see where, where he'd gotten to. Is that something you had to sell Todd on or did he get that right away that that's going to be a better way of understanding how the movie's really coming together? He got it right away. I think I, I just said, I'm going to call this stuff in order. And he said, yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. It was, I, if, if he had already been thinking it, I was already thinking it. I, I mean, I feel like at this point we're, we're pretty good as as far as like knowing what we're looking for. At least I feel like I, I kind of know what he's looking for out of the scenes and generally he's pretty happy with, you know, I'll show him versions of the scene, either things that he wants to see during shooting or things that I'm just excited about. And I put it together and I'm like, wow, this is really great. And I'll show him that stuff. The other things he doesn't look at so much until we get to, you know, we don't necessarily look at things in order every day because he's shooting and we don't have time to, to sit down and look through everything every day. So. so you talked about having an embarrassment of riches in terms of coverage, in terms of performances that Joaquin gave you to choose from, but also, you know, manipulating where certain story points or lines of dialogue would go. Was there, had, did the movie change all that much during post-production where there might've been bigger beats that were at one point in the film that you had to move to later on just because of pacing or because uh, you weren't revealing enough about the character quickly enough? Yes. I mean, throughout, I'd say that the biggest changes ended up being certain, certain portions that we had to rearrange. So in the beginning it was, you know, there's, there's a, the first, let's say third of the movie or, or maybe quarter of the movie before, you know, you're kind of revealing his life. 
And we were choosing the, you know, we spent a lot of time choosing the order in which we, we wanted to reveal his life before he really begins his change. Um, and that, that definitely, we spent a lot of time looking at, okay, well, you know, when do we put these pieces, in what order do we put these pieces of information? Later, when there is a, there's, you know, more plot driven things, it was about how far can we, how far apart can these two plot pieces be? Do we put them next to each other? Do we extend them? You know, how, how, at what point does he find out certain pieces of information about his life that he didn't know in that, in when we, at the beginning, when we just see his life as it is? You know, you hear a lot about directors, um, like a recent example I can think of is Quentin Tarantino and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where they will have screenings for their crew of other films that they want to, you know, just use to set the tone for something. And this film, Joker, has certainly been written up as being reflective of, 70s era films, uh, very specifically Taxi Driver, um, King of Comedy. Were those ever discussed between you and Todd, or did he ever say, listen, the type of movie I'm going for can be seen here, here, and here? It wasn't so much discussed. I did ask him what, I was like, what, any, what do you want me to watch before we get into this? And he just said anything from the 1970s, which is basically what I did. Um, the King of Comedy, I right after I read the script, I went back and watched King of Comedy immediately just to, you know, because I knew that Robert De Niro was going to be in it, and that was exciting. And it was like, okay, let's, I want to see how much of a continuation this character is from his character in that. But beyond that, obviously, Taxi Driver, yes, 100%. I watched that before. King of Comedy, I watched Network, you know, was, was another big one that was influential. I watched The Master before just because it, I wanted to see, you know, that's there's so much Joaquin in that that I wanted to see, you know, kind of what he was going to bring to it. I uh, All these things I'd seen before, but it was worth a rewatch kind of in order. Um, and then beyond that, I just, I, whatever I was, I, I tried to pick up things that I hadn't seen, let's say from the 1970s. Panic on Needle Park was one that I just happened to, to put on that I remember that was like, I don't know if this will apply, but let's see, you know, it, certainly the filmmaking style applies. French Connection is one of my favorite movies of all time, things like that. And and, and if something I've, I've, I've mentioned before is, is the, if you, the, in the chase sequences in there, if you listen to the footsteps, we tried to make them sound similar to the French Connection, like the footsteps that you hear, the kind of clop, clop, clop in that New York of that 70s, uh, similar to what you hear in the French Connection. So since that's really more of an element of sound design, do you, did you work closely with the sound team to say like, listen, I'm, this is what I was feeling or thinking of an editorial. Can you, you know, try and adhere to that or take a look at French Connection and, and see what I'm talking about? Well, I, I do. I remember mentioning that one particularly in the mix, but it was, you know, our, our sound supervisor, Alan Murray, uh, was one of his early jobs was on the Warriors. So we, yeah. So immediately, immediately I, I was just like, he was like, yeah, I'll send you all the subway sounds for that. I'm like, great. Because that's, that's amazing. That's what we're looking for. So again, you know, another piece of influence in there. And, um, that's kind of, you know, we, we built it. There's certain things within the sound, like, uh, obviously we're going for kind of a New York vibe, but then making Gotham its own place. So if you were to listen to the sirens that happen in the background, they're not American sirens. They're either a version of a European or they're a completely, um, they're a completely new thing that, that Alan had actually had made up, but it was, we wanted to give it a slightly off feeling, but you know. Um, so that it, it says this is Gotham is its own place, but there is definitely a lot of New York in there too. So that's a really cool example. If you have, um, you have a friend to tell you they're going to go see the film, is there anything you would tell them, hey, hey, look, look for this or listen for this? Are there something really unique in this film that I think you should be fun if you caught it? Um, there's there's uh, three rats that we added throughout. There's mention, there's mention of some large rats in the movie, and we did add a couple of rats. Uh, I won't tell anybody where they are so that they can find them. Uh, I do know, but it's uh, if you look out, if you see any, if you see any moving rats in the background, those were added later. The other thing I would tell my friends if they were going to see the movies, don't bring the kids. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> well, if you have friends that would bring the kids, you might want to reevaluate your friendship. But um, so going back to those films that you referenced, so great examples of tonality and like, okay, this is the vibe, this is the feeling we're going for. Did you also pick up any sort of techniques in terms of editing? Well, you know, one of the things that you see a lot is that there's a lot, there is a lot less editing in a lot of those movies. Um, you know, that's the takes play for longer and it's something that we were definitely looking to do throughout. At one point we would go through, we were going through certain scenes and saying, okay, where can we remove edits? 
um, there were there would be scenes where it's like, okay, you have this you know this thing that you want to show, but at the same time, is it more valuable to just let's say stay on Joaquin, which is really when we were removing edits, that's what we were doing, is we were just staying with him, um, which always worked because he's it's a captivating performance, and so it was kind of like that. If there was ever a question as to what to look at, it was you were always looking at him. Um, but yes, it was, we definitely tried, it wasn't trying not to overcut things and, and to, um, in a way, get in the way of the performance and make it look manufactured because it, it's not, you know, he's, like I said, he's doing, he's doing great stuff all the time and we'd want to kind of let that shine. Okay. So let's go back to Todd Phillips a little bit, cause this is not your first time out working with him. Just if you wouldn't mind, give me a little rundown of, of how you and Todd first started working together and what you've done since, because I think that might inform um, a lot about your relationship here on Joker. I worked, on, I got hired on a movie called Project X, which the director was Nima Narazada, but the producers were Todd Phillips and Joel Silver. And so I worked with Todd initially on that, um, you know, even when we were locking the movie, like I said, he knows how to use an Avid, and I feel like he doesn't, he doesn't want a movie locked until until he can sit down at that avid, hold the mouse and scroll through the timeline. Like that, then he knows it's real. It's there. And it's going to go out to theaters the way that we've kind of blocked it. And so he definitely, he did that on project X. He's done that for, he did that on hangover three and war dogs. Um, and definitely did that on this one. In fact, I actually, I should, I should say I, I use the mouse left-handed. I'm right-handed, but I use the mouse left-handed. I have a right-handed mouse as well that, that lives on the right side just for Todd. So, so we have, we have, we have identical mice, <laughs> just he's got one over on the side that, that he can pick up at any time. So literally have dueling mice where we've done that. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, I would say the other thing that the thing that he really likes to do is the title tool. If we're putting titles, he places every title on his, on every, all the titles on his movies are placed very specifically by him. Is there is some reason for that or just it's, he loves to do that? I think he likes to do it. Okay. Well, that's the best reason for doing anything. <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that I probably couldn't get it there. I think that he just likes to, he likes to know that that's where it He's goes. He's never given you the elbow and said, hang on a second, Jeff. Let me just show you what I mean here and started noodling on the thing. Uh, not so much the elbow, but I, if, if, if he grabs the mouse, I, you know, sometimes, sometimes we actually work it in tandem, but uh, if he grabs the mouse and let him let him go and see what it, see what he's up to. So let's talk about your your editing crew for a little bit. Tell me about um, the setup you had in terms of equipment, but also your assistance and basically your just your small team that you had working with you. Um, we had a pretty typical. I mean, I, I the way I use the Avid is the way that I've been using the Avid for twenty two years at this point. It's I've got three monitors. I've got a big monitor on either the left or the right of me, and director sits either behind or next to me. And that's that's really my setup. I, as far as audio goes, I, I run LCR, which is it's nice because you can get the dialogue out of the way of the music, but it's not too much to deal with in terms of like a five point one. I, I don't get bogged down in where things are going in the in the tracks. I just leave that for the mix. I have to tell you that comes up all the time in these interviews. This this it seems it's almost like a running debate, like to do five one an editorial or not. And some people are like, no, that's just more than I want to deal with leave that for the audio guys. And then some people are like, you know, in the, in our editor room, we want as close to a cinematic experience as possible just to help, help us all feel like we're closer to the finished product, I guess. Right. And I'm sure someday somebody will say, we got to do five one. And I'll be like, okay, we'll do five one. It doesn't, I'm, I'm not that concerned about it. I used to up until recently, I just would cut stereo uh, for the, you know, for the first few months. And then when we do our first preview, I'd move it to LCR. Uh, but I really, yeah, I've, I've never set up more than three speakers in the, in the cutting room. Um, as far as assistance, my first assistant's name is Jeff me, uh, which you can imagine with Jeff growth, Jeff me, it becomes, it's, it can lead to some fun, uh, back and forth, but he, uh, second assistant on this one was Ray Neapolitan. Uh, Jeff, I've been working with since I worked on the movie religious, uh, in 2008. Eight, I think that was. Um, and Ray Neapolitan, who was our second, uh, worked on Hangover 3 with us and then came back for this one. Um, Lisa Dennis, I've worked with in the last three movies as she's our post-production supervisor. And uh, Jason Reuter, uh, music editor, who's fantastic. I've worked with him on all the movies I've done with Todd. Um, and anyway, those so, so Todd and I basically had a cutting room that was off-site. We had a cutting room that was in the larger cutting room. So like our cutting room had all these people in it, plus visual effects, 
we had two floors of a building on Sunset, and then uh, and we had a cutting room in there. But then we had another Avid that was offsite that was just the two of us, and that's where we did most of the editing. That that's interesting. You had sort of like a satellite, almost. It's almost like the club within the club editing setup. It was in a whole other location, and it was just kind of the two of us. If people were coming in to look at things, they would come in there. Um, like if Joaquin were to come in or Bradley or Emma or anybody like that, they would come in and look there. But it was, and but for the most part, it was it was the two of us. Bradley came in for uh, on and off for a couple of months to look at stuff, which was, I mean, he's a great director as well. So it's like, it was nice to have that perspective. And Joaquin came in a few times and looked at things. I have to ask what kind of notes that uh, Joaquin and Bradley kind of had for you. I can't even begin to encompass Bradley's notes. It was all the, all sorts. I mean, it's like having another director in the room who's going to give you, you know, as detailed as you should cut here or as as large as you should take this piece and move it around here. And it was great to have, you know, somebody else. Like if we were stuck, he would he would come in and kind of kick us down the field. Uh, Joaquin just had, you know, a lot of his was he was, he was very focused on his performance. Um, he had other notes as well that were bigger picture in terms of how you feel like, he, he was always uh, very much looking at how how you feel, like how the feeling is surrounding the character. I mean, and it's and it's his. And he was always looking to kind of feel what he felt on the day in the edit room. So we talked, or at least I mentioned at the beginning of the, our discussion, um, that this is a character that's been played out many times theatrically. Um, but when you think about those other films, what comes to mind? Certainly, there were great performances, but you think of the big set piece moments. You think of it as, as sort of an action adventure, superhero kind of movie. And in talking about Joker, it feels like a lot of it is more of the smaller moments. It really is more of a character study, truly. Yes. And you mentioned Joaquin's what he cared about was performance and story. Did you find that that was for you personally more of the fun stuff to work on, the smaller, more intimate scenes, as opposed to any set piece type moments that happened in the film? I mean, it was all fun to work on, but I, the action definitely does take a back seat. I mean, I feel like once we had the action scenes assembled, they didn't change in a significant way. I mean, it was it was they're pretty well put together and and just kind of stayed in that way. It wasn't we weren't looking to say, okay, we need to up this, we need to up that. Um, there's a, there's a car crash shot that I know that we added late in the game that really helped that. But, you know, other than that, it was, it, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of debate going on in terms of, in terms of the action, the more action pieces. And there's not a ton of them in there where the debate definitely was, was, was character and story and, and, and looking and saying, okay, can the, you know, like, has he gotten to this point yet in terms of intensity? If he has gotten to this point, the next scene's not as intense. How did he recover from that? You know, and it, that was that was most of the discussion. Most of the time, it was just just guiding this character from beginning to end. Do you have any tools or techniques that you use, whether actually within the Avid in terms of organization or color coding, or just physical analog like three by five cards on the wall that you use in terms of keeping track of how those elements are balancing out story wise? Hundred percent, three by five cards on the wall. Those are were hugely important to us, and in fact. What we do with them is, you know, we've got the picture on them and the picture itself was important. We actually ended up reprinting them several times to make sure we were getting. And, and even as the movie went on, it was kind of like, OK, this scene now means something a little different. We need a different still frame to represent it so that when we look at it, we can we immediately know the meaning as we're looking up and down that board. So we kind of would reprint those cards throughout the editing process as the scene changed to better represent what was there. But we used those. We actually had we had an identical board in the the larger office and then the you know the and one just like it in the satellite office that were being we're kind of sending pictures back and forth updating it a lot of people listening to this their first job or the first job they hope to achieve in filmmaking would be as an assistant editor or an apprentice editor what is it you're looking for um, in a good assistant I guess the number one thing for me is management of the cutting room I don't like to do too much managing of the cutting room I I, I kind of get stuck in my my own world of putting things together so uh the most important thing an assistant can do is manage and anticipate you know what uh the editor will need and i guess if there's if there's a a, a sense of practicing that you get or or you know like if you're if you're look as an assistant if you're looking to move up into an editor position one of the things that you can see as the practice for that is thinking about like okay if i were to be cutting what would i want what would i like how would i want things set up what would i want doing you know and doing those things for the editor and or learning what the editor wants and you know again thinking in that way even if you're not doing all that work with 
the footage that you can be thinking about how how that thing those things get set up and that then kind of puts you in the mindset of the editor um i guess in the way that the editor is looking at like what does the audience want it's the assistant can be looking at it's like that's your audience is the editor that's your advice for somebody wanting to be an assistant how did you get your start uh, I got my start actually in, in an avid training center. I was, I, I, at the very end of college, I saw an avid for the first time and I was like, wow, what is that? I'd used kind of tape to tape editors. And, and while I was in high school, we had gotten a hold of some, some, uh, old cable access equipment. Uh, and at the end of college, I saw an avid for the first time. And I was like, wow, what is that? And so after I graduated, I literally called avid and said, Hey, I'm going to move away. Cause I was living in Ohio. I was like, I'm going to move away. Uh, I want to take an AVID course. Where should I go? And uh, they're like, well, where are you considering? This is this never happened before, first of all. I'm like, where are you considering? I said, well, I'm considering going to Portland, Oregon or, or New York City. And they said, well, both have good training centers, so, you know, take your pick. Um, I did. I ended up moving to Portland, and I got an internship at the AVID training center because I couldn't actually afford the classes at the time. Uh, got an internship there, worked there for three months, got hired and stayed there for two years, uh, then moved to New York. And, um, friends, people that I'd worked with that I had, that I'd helped teach over the course of that two years who were living in New York then, I mean, it was 1998 and knowing Avid was a real commodity at that time. So, uh, you know, people that they worked with said, Hey, does he know how to use an Avid? And they're like, yeah, he taught me. They're great. Can he come in tomorrow? And so I was working on, you know, various like documentary projects and things like that. Did some work for A&E. I did end up doing some tech support work for Tribeca Film Center. Uh, for a while for the their avid rental arm for about half a year to a year while i was doing the tech support i ended up i cut a movie kind of in the back room with uh, an extra avid and that went to sundance in 1999 and um since then i guess that's i i really never spent much time as an assistant so that said back to the assistant question i have an immense amount of respect for what they do because i don't actually think i could do that job well, I think if anybody took the time to peruse your IMDb page in the years that followed, you've basically done every type of work, your documentary, narrative television, um, reality television, feature film. Do you think that, you know, as a feature film editor now, that rich tapestry of experience that you had to draw from, does that really help you? Or do you feel like, you know what, I should have just been focused on feature work the whole time? Because some people do go into this with just blinders on like, no, if you want to be a feature editor, and this is the advice they'll get a lot of times, if you want to be a feature editor, be a feature editor, or at least, you know, start off on that track. Don't fall into the trap of reality television. You'll never get out. That's a theme you hear about a lot. It's true. And it's, it is, um, it's kind of amazing that I made it to, from any sort of documentary world. I mean, it was the rea reality te television at that time when I was working in it meant something different. It was, it was more of like, you know, short form documentary things that you'd see uh, now on like National Geographic or even even they've moved on to other forms. But, it you know, it's like A&E, I guess, back then they were they were doing more investigative reports, I think, is one of the shows that I worked on way back then. It's definitely not uh, there's I when people ask me, you know, how do, how do I get to that point? I, I have no clear path in mind. I mean, certainly the most the most likely if you want to be a feature film editor is to come up in a feature cutting room. Uh, that's not something that I did, but I can't recommend the way I did it because it was a couple very gentle moves, um, really moving, you know, from television documentary to feature documentary to, you know, and then kind of blurring the lines right around entourage was when I kind of blurred, like, which was done in a very naturalistic style. Um, and they, you know, they were interested. And then also um, Project X, which was done as a found footage movie. So they were interested in somebody who could, who was already familiar with that language as in treating the camera as a character. So there's one of the characters in the movie is standing behind the camera. And I had just come off of working with Larry Charles on a pilot that was just like that. And that's how I ended up coming, kind of coming to Project X. I was already talking their language by the time I, I walked into the room. So working in unscripted or working in documentary, do you find that that sort of helps build a storytelling muscle that you have a way of crafting a story sometimes when it isn't really there? Like you're, you're able to, to sort of steal shots that weren't intended to be used in the scene or just basically cultivate a story point that was just never there on the page or certainly not there in the footage the way it was intended. Yeah, I mean, that's actually kind of my answer to that is that absolutely that is a that's something that you get. I mean, it's the, the practice for doing that kind of thing is all there. And 
certainly experimentation. I mean, there's no, I'd say there's probably no greater spot for experimentation than in a documentary. I mean, you're, you're, you're starting from generally an idea or possibly an outline. You know, you have a lot of things, but it's, you, you have a certain, you have a finite amount of footage to cover a finite amount of, you know, audio basically and figuring how the two juxtapose, you know, just taking things that you never thought would work, but trying them. And that's the nice thing about having come up really in nonlinear editing situation is that it's a non-destructive process. You can always, you know, save copy and just try the next thing, try another one. And just in the timeline right there, it's just, it's, you know, there's, there's the idea that not cutting on film or not using tape to tape machines saves you time. I don't know that it really saves you time. It just, it means that you get to explore within that same amount of time, you get to explore all the different opportunities. Were you, were you creating lots of versions of different scenes? I've talked to editors where like, you know, I might end up having like 30, 50 different versions of the film that I save in a bin because I'm just, I have the freedom to do that. And I always want to be able to go back to, you know, sometimes you follow a, a thread or you go down a rabbit hole and you're like, you know what? I, I should have just gone back to where I started. You know, cut, cut number four was really the best one. Oh yeah, absolutely. I save it every day. I mean, there's been a change in, I mean, generally it's the reels. Like I bet I put things into reels as quickly as I can once I get them assembled. And I don't, I try not to do too much changing of the scenes before they get assembled. So once they're assembled, I try to leave it, let it sit until I can get the rest of the movie assembled. But once that happens, every time I, I make any change in a reel, I'll, I'll version up. So it's, I mean, our audio people are like, oh, wow, so, you know, version 75 of reel three. I'm like, yep, that's, I mean, but, you know, 50 of those might be small changes and 25 of them might be huge changes. So because performance is so important and because, you know, Joaquin gave you so much to work with, I'm sure there were a lot of, takes that he did where you're like, oh, this, this is the one, but the timing is off a little bit or something happened in the background. Something I hear a lot of editors talk about is using different techniques for saving a performance, whether something like a fluid morph or, or a wipe. Do you have any tricks that you rely on to, to manipulate performance if you have to? Um, in one of the scenes where we wanted to shorten the time between something and Joaquin stayed so still that I could actually cut two seconds out of the shot and nobody ever saw it. That doesn't exist in the movie anymore, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd tell you where it is because it was pretty amazing. Um, as far as, like, there was definitely no saving the performance. It was it was all there. I didn't have to, to do too much to, to uh, you know, make it good. It was, it was, it was good from the start. Um, in fact... Day one, I had this realization as I was looking at footage for the first time that I've never seen anything come across my Avid screens that was as good as this. I mean, it's certainly the best thing I've ever been a part of. Was there a particular moment or section of the film that you found to be the most challenging or that you, I don't want to say struggled with, but I can't think of a better word, but you know, something that you you recall now, like, wow, that was a tough one to get through. That was a tough one to find the film in that moment. Well, there is a scene... There's a scene where he is in the bathroom with his mother, and we, I would say there is no scene that we had a greater difficulty figuring out where that should go than that one. There are some, there are some other scenes. There's a few scenes that live out there. There's the first time that he's in with the social worker, and I think we probably spent more time dealing with that scene, whether it be the placement or the content or um, the cuts or the, you know, just the reactions in that scene than anything else. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's another one that, that beats that one, but that one was definitely, I mean, that's, and that's the one that it was originally, I, I talked about originally being scene one. Um, it, it was a huge scene and we couldn't play the whole thing. It was, it was too much to play it, especially in its current, uh, where it lives currently. And it was because it just gave you too much. It was, it told you things that we would have seen, you know, immediately afterwards. Um, so we spent a lot of time because it's early on, it's a character, it's, it goes to character and, um, it just, there was, there was so much there. We had so many kind of options as to what to put in the scene and what to take out of the scene. And, uh, it definitely, that's the one. <laughs> okay. So the, the final running time of the film is about two hours, which you look at a lot of films lately and they're, they're not shy about letting it run. You know, I mentioned once upon a time in Hollywood, that's like two fifty. It chapter two was right up there. Did you ever feel like I get so much great stuff to work with? Let's just let it play out. Day, I would say, you know, January 7th or 9th or whatever it was of, 
of 2019, day one of really kind of Todd walking in t- once we'd finished shooting. When we talked about it, I think he said, I, like, this should this movie's probably going to end up at about an hour 53. How did, he know, how did he know that? He just, that's, he's good at that. <laughs> he does it, he does it every movie and it's, and it's always within, it's always within a, a minute or two, I would say. And if not dead on, and this one, if you took the credits off is an hour and 53 or four, it's, I mean, that, and, and that's what we're, what we're talking about is, is timing it, it initially at that point without the credits at that time, I hadn't finished real seven and the movie was already two and a half hours long. So I wasn't sure that we were going to get there. And, it, you know, and, and a month into it, we were thinking, okay, well, now the movie's going to be 220. But as, as things, as we just continued to, to kind of look at things and move things around, things started to naturally fall out. I mean, there's, there's, an, there's an early stage at which I think you, you can identify certain things immediately and say like, okay, well, obviously when you watch this beginning to end, it's like we did a, we did a good job getting all this stuff, but we just don't need it. And then you know, it gets a little harder over time, uh, as you get down. So I would say the the journey from two hours and 20 minutes to two hours was a difficult one, but the journey from, let's say two forty five to two, two hours and 20 was not. So when actors go out on these press junkets and promote the film, you know, they come armed with a clip and they, the host says, let's watch a clip from Joker. If you were going out and promoting this film, what clip or what scene from the film would you take? What, you know, what would you want to be emblematic of your work on the film? I would say, I, I mean, I think my favorite scene uh, is the scene that he has, his final scene with Randall and Gary. Um, I don't want to say too much about it, but it is, I'd say it's about a five minute long scene. And he is, and he's wearing white, he's not, he's wearing white makeup. He hasn't, he hasn't fully gotten into his, into his Joker, uh, but it's towards the end of the movie. And um, that is probably my favorite scene though it's difficult because I really, there's I mean when I when I say that I think of 10 others that I really love too so so we talked about all the different types of films you've done hangover 3 comedy joker very different very dark although I would say you know to look at Todd's movies going from hangover 3 to war dogs to joker isn't a crazy progression I mean hangover 3 was definitely darker there was there was a lot of dark themes in there and it and themes of kind of like responsibility you know alan finally you know seeing the consequences of an, of his actions you know war dog certainly it got termed as a comedy with todd phillips directing and jonah hill starring it it's tough not to get thrown into that category but there really weren't many jokes in it um i'd say probably uh, you know up to 10 and then certain situations that you would otherwise find funny but it was largely more dramatic so with all the experience you have had, is there a type of project that you've yet to do or one that you want to do more of moving forward? Um, it's not so much. I don't look at genres so much as what I like, um, what I think sounds cool or a movie that I would want to see. I mean, I would, I'd be willing to work on any, any variety of movie as long as it's something that I'd say like, yeah, I'd want to see that. Before we close things out, I have to ask, because you, you mentioned your experience as a trainer. Did you ever teach Todd anything? Or did he ever teach you anything on the Avid? If he's got his hand on the mouse and I see something faster uh, that he could do faster, I'll tell him, I'll, I'll say, yeah, just, you know, like hit the caps lock or something like that. Uh, if it's something that, because, you know, he doesn't use it every day. So he, he, he remembers a lot, but there's a lot of little things that, that obviously tiny little things. Uh, what he really loves is the segment tool, the, the yellow arrow, which I'm like, why? It's the most volatile tool on the keyboard. I mean, what do you... <laughs> Is, but you know, every time he's he's like, "Hey, can we use the segment tool for them?" I'm like, "Yeah, we can use it for that one." He's like, "Great, I love that tool." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch out for that yellow segment arrow in Media Composer. With great power comes great responsibility. If you have seen Joker, you know that Jeff employed that great power very responsibly and honored both Joaquin Phoenix's performance and Todd Phillips's direction by helping to craft the movie they set out to make. One that has certainly got a lot of people talking. Speaking of talking, I need to stop soon. But before I do, I would like to remind you that you too can wield the mighty yellow segment arrow of Media Composer as well. The only trick is that you have to get Media Composer, which is really no trick at all. It's pretty easy, just a few clicks here and a few bucks a month there, and you have the same tools that Jeff and Todd Phillips too don't want to leave him out in his right mouse. The same tools that they had to make Joker. And if you already use Media Composer, thank you, uh, but tell a friend to use it. 
While you're at it, tell a friend to listen to The Rough Cut. Hell, tell an enemy. I don't care. I just want more folks to hear what these very talented people have to say on this show. Jeff is certainly one of those very talented people, and I want to thank him for his time on the show today. There are many more great episodes with very cool people coming up, so keep streaming, downloading, subscribing. Just keep doing whatever it is you do to be here. I appreciate it. Until we meet again, this is Matt Fury saying so long, and thanks for joining me here on The Rough Cut. We'll be right back.